when the worldwide church of God went into heresy years ago, it was particularly damaging on the younger generation. Many of my friends got pulled right out of the church, many who had grown up in the church, and over the years, it's hard not to ask the question, why? What happened? What tripped them up? And I don't think there is an easy answer. There are many different circumstances, many different situations. Uh, So many doctrines were upended at that time. Those of you who were around remember. But I think one of the main concepts that was misapplied was the matter of grace. The matter of grace. We were told that, well, we've never really taught grace before. Mr. Armstrong was all about law, 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 nothing about grace. And, of course, that was a lie, but many were fooled by the lie. The misapplication of grace has been a huge tool in Satan's arsenal for many years, for many centuries. Frankly, back all the way to the Garden of Eden, we know that, which is why he uses it over and over again, because all too often it works so well. We find it back in the first century in Jude 4. Uh, Jude writes, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation on godly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn the grace of our God into lewdness or wantonness or licentiousness or license to do evil. One commentary defines it this way, violent spite which rejects restraint and indulges in lawless insolence. That's what Jude said was happening already in his day. So Satan has gotten people to believe that God's mercy and his love and grace actually allows lawlessness. And frankly, that's why we see the mess that we see today that society is in. Uh, Because of the seeds that were planted many, many centuries ago. The attitude of lawlessness, rejection of any restraint, it comes from the counterfeit religion that, that Satan sold to humanity long ago. And again, many of my friends fell prey to it a generation ago. So here's a question. How can we as parents best prepare our children to recognize the deception of cheap grace? How can we be ready? How can we help them to be ready the next time that trial comes around? Because it will. It's the same method Satan has used over and over again. It might be in a different package, but at its base, it's the same, and it will come back around again. So let's examine that question today. How can we as parents teach our children about the true grace of God and even help them to see it lived and practiced in our home? If you'd like a title for today, Teaching Children About Grace. Teaching Children About Grace. An alternative title might be Law, Grace, and Super Mario. We won't use that, but you'll see as we go along what I mean. You know, no matter what we teach our children, at some point they have to make their own decisions. Adam and Eve had the perfect parent, and they chose the wrong path. So good teaching doesn't always guarantee good results. Even so, should we not do all we possibly can to use every bit of our resources and our time and our energy and our effort to help arm our children, much as we would teach them to avoid strangers and avoid dangers, avoid running into the street or playing with dangerous substances, Well, there are spiritual dangers as well. The general principle is Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, or many translations say, 
even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So I know some of you may think, well, I don't have any children or small children, so this doesn't apply to me, so I can take a nap now. Well, if you need to take a nap, go ahead. Just, just don't, don't make it too loud. Don't disturb the rest of us. But, uh, but you know what? Actually, it applies to all of us because we were just at the feast a few months ago, and didn't we rehearse how the fact, how that all of us are going to be If we're in God's kingdom, we're going to be saints ruling over cities, and we might be interacting with even thousands of people who will be like our children, in in, in some ways might even be more of a connection at that time through God's spirit and through our ability to help them as spirit beings than our physical children today. And certainly we'll be teaching parents how to help their children learn these lessons. So even if you have no children now, or even if your children are grown, are we not going to be teaching in the future at some point? A few years ago, Mr. Ames gave a sermon, God's Throne of Grace. In it, he defines grace, and he said this, What is grace? The Dictionary of Paul and his letters On page 372, it says, In Pauline usage, the Greek word for grace is charis or charis. It carries the basic sense of favor. And when God or Christ is a subject, acting in grace toward humankind is undeserved favor. So that's the definition of grace that we we find in the Bible. Uh, Mr. Uh, He also refers to a Tomorrow's World article. January 2021, grace, freedom to sin? Grace, freedom to sin? And the answer, of course, is no. Uh, Grace is freedom from the consequences of sin, the penalties of sin, not the freedom to do whatever we want without consequences. There's also a good summation in a whiteboard on the Tomorrow's World YouTube site entitled, Understanding God's Grace the most incredible gift explained in five simple points. So there are a number of resources that can help us and even help our children as we're learning this. But where do we start when teaching our children? Well, I don't often use video games in a positive light in a sermon, but I'm going to make an exception today. I hesitate to use this example but I think it makes a point. <clears throat> There's an article that came up, oh, maybe 10 years ago, on a website entitled, Why You Should Parent Like a Video Game. And uh, you can Google it. You can find it yourself. It's actually pretty good, believe it or not. I think it gives us some insights into understanding God's grace, believe it or not, and how we can teach it. Now, before you think I've gone completely crazy and tuned me out, uh, just stay with me, and I think uh, you'll see what I mean as we go. So the short article has just three points. Let me introduce the first point. Again, it's from the article, Why Should You Parent Like a Video Game? Number one, the first point is establish clear rules. Establish clear rules. Rules. Now, what does the author mean? He says this. When you're playing a video game, you need to know, you know, that a button makes you punch. Touching a bad guy will kill you, and you need a certain amount of XP before you can level up. Knowing the rules helps you operate confidently within the game's landscape. In the same way, make sure your kids know what the rules are in your family. Keep your rules clear and simple. Just like in a video game, input A gets you output B every single time. It's really, it's good advice. Uh, Simple is good, isn't it? Uh, Mr. Mr. Weston has admonished us multiple times at camp and in other venues and sermons, I I think, that um, to not make an endless number of rules, not, not just have an endless, infinite number of rules, But the rules we make, make sure we enforce them. Every single time, all the time. And that's a great, 
great point for in the home. Going on, the author says, giving your children consistent limits, rewards, and discipline is one key to helping them develop an internal locus of control. People with an internal locus of control believe that by doing A, they can get B. They see a correlation between action and consequence versus believing in blind luck or that the world is out to get them. Show your kids that good behavior leads to reward. Bad behavior leads to punishment. Consistent parenting ingrains these kinds of connections in your child's mind and bolsters their confidence and resilience. There's so much wisdom in that. So much wisdom. I think, uh, I like the way he puts it. The, the, you know, those are the basics of a video game. When you do A, you get B. And it's that way all the time, isn't it? They're reliable. The rules are dependable. They create the right expectations. There are no surprises. You know what you're going to get based on your actions every time without fail. So what does this have to do with grace? Let's turn over to Genesis. Genesis. The story of the flood is actually a good place to learn about grace, believe it or not. In the story of the flood, we know that the earth was had been corrupted to the point where everything was falling apart. Virtually the whole population of the world was fully going headlong into the way of pride and vanity and and violence and lust and greed. And then in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, verse 6, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's interesting. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I, I thought grace was a New Testament concept, or not. Maybe it's an Old Testament concept. Actually, actually it is. Yes, Jesus Christ came to give his, his, his life. That is the, the ultimate act of grace, showing God's grace and favor toward man. But grace itself, as defined as God's favor, is not just limited to that. It's actually how God looks at mankind. It's actually an aspect of God's character. It's actually his, his desire to bless and guide mankind if we will just cooperate. And Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. It's interesting, too, that the New Testament word charis corresponds with this Old Testament word, which is uh, number 2580 in Strong's uh, Kana or Kana, uh, the, the helps word studies makes this comment that charis uh, of the New Testament answers directly to the Hebrew term Kana. In other words, they both describe the same concept. Both refer to God freely extending himself, his favor, his grace, reaching, inclining to people because he's disposed to bless them or to be near to them. So no difference in the concept between the New Testament and the Old Testament. So are there any clues to why God was extending his favor or his grace to Noah to bless him? Well, let's keep reading. Genesis 6 and verse 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy or history of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. He was just he was perfect, meaning he was, he was he spiritually mature. He was full grown. He was becoming complete. It doesn't mean perfect as in not ever making a mistake. Noah sinned. Noah was a sinner just like every, everyone else, just like us, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he wasn't living a lifestyle of sin. He was living a lifestyle of seeking God, and he was just and walked with God. In other words, he followed 
the rules. Chapter 7 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the house, uh, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Another descriptor of Noah, he was a righteous man. Why was God showing favor to him? No, Noah didn't earn God's favor. God, God didn't, wasn't wringing his hand. Well, you know, I guess uh, Noah has earned enough righteousness. I just have to put him in the ark. No. But because Noah was seeking God, God gave him that tremendous blessing. And chapter 7 and verse 5, notice, And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. What an interesting statement. Yes, in the uh, instructions about building the ark and, and saving the animals and going into the ark and, and, and all of that, but it's also, don't you think, sort of a commentary of Noah's whole life. He just did what God said. And he was the only one on the face of the earth. Do you ever feel alone? Do you ever feel like, wow, you know, I'm only the only one doing the right thing? Tell Noah someday. Tell Noah, ask him how it felt for him. Literally, he and his family were the only ones on the face of the earth who were truly seeking God. We have the benefit of having each other. And he, he didn't. No, God didn't, Noah didn't earn God's favor. And it doesn't mean that God didn't love all those people unconditionally. He does, did love them unconditionally, loves all people today unconditionally, no matter what they do. But that unconditional love doesn't mean he will let them not deal with the consequences of their actions. And most of the people at that time were cutting themselves off from blessings from God by their actions because they weren't following the rules. So back to the video game. You know, everyone can understand when I do A, I get B. It's not complicated. But how is it that in society somehow we jump the track? We think, well, I should be able to have bad behavior and yet get good results. I should be able to cut corners on the job and yet get paid, promoted, and have great benefits. I should be able to do whatever I want and be happy, rich, and famous. Right? It doesn't work that way. If we want good results, we've got to play by the rules, and that's a powerful lesson to teach our children. So, brethren, what are the rules in your house? Those of you who have, who have children who are growing, small children or, or, or other. Obviously, the laws of God should be the foundation, but maybe you've made other rules if, as time has gone by. One thing that my wife and I have found is that you make rules as situations come up as needed. You don't just come up with a hundred rules, you know, the, the day your, your first baby is born. Okay, now we've got a list of rules. No, as time goes by, you begin to figure out, okay, this happened. We need to make a rule for that. We need to have a policy for that. And over time, you modify them based on need. Maybe a rule becomes unnecessary. We're reevaluating all the time. You know, when, when children are small especially little boys, they like to make noise. And, um, you know, you can yell at them for being annoying. And um, maybe you need to think through, well, why am I being annoyed, you know? Um, am I just having a bad day? Or is there an issue? <laughs> is there something that actually needs to be dealt with? And maybe... Uh, thinking it through, maybe it's a matter of time and place. Maybe they can't hoop and holler in the house, but maybe outside. They can hoop and holler all they want. So, okay, now that's the rule. You don't go screaming through the house. You can do that outside, but not in the house. When I was growing up, when my brothers and I and sisters, my, uh, we had three boys and two girls, and my brothers and I inevitably would wind up wrestling. I don't know what it is about boys being in the same house or room, and eventually you're going to wind up wrestling. And as we got older, 
it, uh, you know, the, the, the arms and legs were bigger and longer, and then things were flying through the, through the, across the room. So my mother and dad realized this isn't working. So the rule was if you wrestle, you take it outside. And that was even in the wintertime. We were in Wisconsin with, you know, two feet of snow. Take it outside. There were times when my dad would lock the door behind us, you know. And um, he didn't do it for long. But uh, we didn't wrestle a long time in the snow. But I think one time we, we did actually wrestle in the snow. My mother also discovered a wonderful tool for stopping boys from wrestling. It, and it's brilliant. It's the equalizer. You don't have to be stronger than them. You don't have to be bigger than them. All you do, and she learned this from another lady who had boys at that time, you just reach down, you grab a clump of hair, and you pull. It's amazing how it incapacitates a big, strong, strapping young man when his mother is pulling his hair straight up. And suddenly he's ready to listen. It's, it's remarkable. It's amazing. The point is, sometimes rules are made for the time and place, and what may be appropriate in one place is not in another but that becomes a rule. And, and as children grow older and as they have more responsibility, we, we talk about parameters. We talk about discussing it with them, what seems fair, what seems reasonable, and depending on their trustworthiness. The point is, if you don't have clear guidelines and rules, there's general frustration for everyone. And I think all of us as parents have, have experienced that because none of us does it perfectly. So how do we teach our children about God's grace? By first teaching them that God sets rules. And if we want to keep playing, we play by the rules, just like in a video game. How is it so easy to understand in a video game and yet sometimes so hard to understand in life? Some people think that rules are only found in the Old Testament, but Jesus Christ talked about rules you know, some people think that he abolished all the rules. Just, just read what he, he said in, in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, talking about adultery, talking about murder. Now it's, it's of the mind, and it's of the heart. And even if we have the intent and the thought to do these things, we're sinning. He didn't do away with law. He didn't do away with the rules. What about Paul? Was he, you know, the great, the great doer away of the, of the law? Did he really do away with rules? Notice 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Paul didn't do away with laws either. He upheld rules and laws. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse Nine, it's uh, when we speak of the laws of God, when we speak of the Ten Commandments, when we speak of the, the moral law, of what, of what is expected of us by God. He said, do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That sounds like a rule to me, doesn't it to you? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty plain. Pretty clear. Just like a video game. So, in our home, as we're teaching God's grace, the first step, is to establish clear rules. It brings us to the next step. Point number two, issue short, consistent resets for bad behavior. Issue short, consistent resets for bad behavior. This is also from the article, Why Should You Parent Like a Video Game? Here's what the author says. In Super Mario Brothers... Does anybody remember playing Super Mario Brothers? You don't have to raise your hand. But um, actually, it came out in 1985, and there are new versions of it today. And uh, so, interesting. Uh, in Super Mario Brothers, if Mario touches a Goomba, 
A Goomba, for the uninitiated, is a sort of a mushroom-shaped monster, okay? So that's, that's that. If Mario touches a Goomba, he dies, and he has to start back at the beginning. So... I won't describe Super Mario any more than that, okay? Uh, and I'll just keep reading. If Mario touches a Goomba, he dies and has to start back at the beginning. There are no warnings. There are no counting to three or bargaining with the Goomba about whether or not Mario dies. Mario doesn't get lectured about how he shouldn't touch unsuspecting Goombas, or nor is he asked why he wasn't paying attention. Ultimately, Mario touched the Goomba, so he has to go back to the beginning. That's it. That's the rule. Isn't it clear? So rules have to be set, but inevitably someone's going to break the rule, right? So we have to make a choice in our families. Do we ignore it? Do we blow up? Do we laugh about it because they're so cute? You know, when they do something at two that's cute, that's disobedient, it's not so cute when they're 14, is it? It's not as cute. It's actually really harmful for them and for everyone around them. Do we let the first, second, third pass until it escalates and then we intervene? Do we give another warning even though the rule was clearly broken? Well, let me quote the article again. He says, when your kids break a rule... The consequences should be quick kick in immediately without a bunch of preliminary back and forth and emotional hullabaloo. I like that term. Uh, Don't give them a warning. Don't negotiate with them. Just issue the consequence, be it a timeout or taking away screen time or adding a chore to the routine or whatever. Don't get angry or raise your voice or start lecturing or ask why they would do such a thing. Don't let your mood dictate the punishment. So that when you're tired and don't want to deal with it, you just let the infraction slide. And when you're irritated, you totally flip out on them. And never criticize their character. You're so naughty. But just their behavior. No, we don't throw blocks in this house. Making them feel as though their character is inherently flawed just induces passivity and hopelessness. Bad behavior, on the other hand, is temporary and something they can work to overcome. Remember, input A gets them output B every time. When they break a rule, they get the same dispassionate tone of response and the same punishment. See, this is what happens when you touch a Goomba. I just think that's brilliant. It's really, really well done. In other words, teach your children, teach our children to understand when you break rules, there are consequences that happen. It doesn't matter if parents, uh, I'm tired and cranky, or I'm in a great mood, I need to make the consequences stick. You know, when I was a uh, youngster, we had a screen door, and it was back in, you know, there was no uh, hydraulic arm that would sort of let the the door close gently, right? Now, if you let go of it, it was going to slam and wake up the whole house and get everybody alerted, especially my dad. And he did not like the sound of a screen door slamming. So I remember many times I'd be running out the door to play baseball or whatever, and I would uh, let it go, and it would slam. And he'd call me back in, and, okay, you're going to close it, open it and close it quietly, whatever, 25 times or 50 times. You know, Some of you may have to do that cruel and unusual unusual punishment as well. It was awful. It scarred me forever. You know? <laughs> but you know, I, I knew that my dad was never going to let that go. It was going to be consistent every single time. And so after a while, I got the point. It's hard to be 100% consistent all the time. You're tired, You get worn out, you're trying to finish another task. Maybe you've said it a thousand times before. My mother always said, you guys don't need me, you need a recording. Just play the recording over and over again. Because that's what kids need. They need consistent reminders. But that's where working together as a couple is so important. 
as a father and a mother. You know, sometimes consistency might be a little more difficult for mothers because they're with children all day. And they're, they've had it up to here by the end of the day, you know. And also they're more emotionally invested oftentimes. They can get worn down emotionally. And fathers, we can tend to be a little bit less emotionally strayed, right? Strayed, swayed, swayed. And so we can help to remind him, no, we can't let this pass. We've got to be consistent. And we can help and we can be involved when we're around and take some of the pressure off of our wives as a matter of working together as a team. There's a proverb that speaks this, Proverbs 29, 17. Correct your son and he will give you rest. You know, some people say, oh, that's selfish of me. You know, I, why should I, you know, correct my son so, just so I can have an easier time? Well, wait a minute. It gives everybody rest. It gives the child rest. It, if we make a rule and every single time it's broken consistently, you know, it only takes a few times and that child understands, okay, there's a real line here. And when I cross it, this is what happens. And sure, they may test it the next day or the next week, but in the long run, they're going to get it in their heads and there's going to be a whole lot less wrangling on the back end. Let me read a little bit of something that Dr. Fall in the booklet uh, Successful Parenting God's Way says on page 17, paragraph 3. He says, parents who do not teach their children cause and effect do those children a serious disservice. How can young people learn cause and effect if they never experience the effects of their behavior? How can toddlers learn cause and effect if when a parent tells them to come here, they find that they can ignore the instruction without any follow-up discipline? How can young children learn cause and effect if their parents simply shrug their shoulders in exasperation when faced with a child's angry tantrum? How can teenagers learn cause and effect if their parents pay the fines when they receive tickets for reckless driving? Consistently with a toddler providing rules and guidelines for conduct and punishment for disobedience leads to consistency as a teen, which leads to consistency as an adult, which can lead to consistency as a future son of God. We're giving them help if we learn and teach them and help them to see. Not perfectly, no one is, but if we strive to be consistent in the home, that they have to deal with the consequence. You know, in today's world, um, how does the world deal with rules and breaking of rules? Well, you know, I feel uncomfortable because I broke the rule, so maybe the rule is the problem. Isn't that what mainstream Christianity essentially has said and has done? Get rid of the rules, and then you don't feel guilty. And that's what we're seeing today in full bloom. We can live a different way in our homes. And we must do a different way. You know, out in the world, rules are bad, rules are restrictive, rules will cramp your style, rules are there to steal away your freedom and your happiness. But where does that come from? If you think about it, Romans 8, 7 says, The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. If we help children to understand rules are for their benefit, they're going to have a better time, an easier time, even understanding how to follow God's rules. If rules are the problem, then, you know, then it's, is it the fault of the rule giver? Let's say if, if uh, my child um, is, is small and I say, okay, do not put this key 
into that electrical plug. You know what's going to happen, right? Oftentimes, some, some will have to experiment and so they put the key in the electrical club, tr plug, and it's kind of shocking. But then they, they learn, you know what? It really wasn't, the, the rule was not the problem. It was my action. And they learn that I need to do what daddy or mommy says, and they might test us on it a few times, but if they feel the consequences, then eventually it'll, it'll sink in. The point is we are striving to help our children to understand there is a consequence for action. So after correction, after we deal with an issue, what then? You know, it says, um, back to the article, Parenting Like a Video Game, it says, when you run into a Goomba, you're not sent to some dungeon level where you have to watch Mario just stand in a prison cell for 10 minutes before you can jump back into the fray. The consequences for the kid's behavior should be similarly consistent, dispassionate, and swift. It's also important to make the timeout or reset short, just like in video games. You don't want to sequester your room, your kid in their room for 20 minutes only to have them throwing books from their shelves and rolling around on the ground, screaming like a banshee the entire time. The purpose of the reset is to get kids to stop whatever inappropriate behavior they're doing and then get them back into the gameplay as soon as possible. That's the point. And that's what we're trying to accomplish when we give correction for inappropriate behavior. To try to get them back to a point where they can get back in the game. Now this does not mean that we don't take time talking with them, especially as children get older. We need to talk about what's happening. What led them to the infraction. Maybe they acted out. Maybe they were abrupt or rude because they felt down or, or, or felt stupid about something. We don't excuse it. We still need to correct it, but we need to try to find and understand what the cause of the problem was. And that sometimes takes time. We also need to see that they have an attitude of repentance. Notice in Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. Luke chapter 18 and verse Nine. You know, when we're dealing with our children, it's important to let them know that we love them unconditionally, that, that we're, not, we're not going to remain angry with them all the time. We're not going to remain upset with them all the time. We're not just letting them know how unhappy we are. We're not having long grudges or punishments that, that are unreasonably long. We're working through a process. And God holds us accountable for how they are taught and how we work with them. But in Luke chapter 18 and verse 9, notice there is a parable that Jesus said, spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. You notice they didn't like tax collectors back then any more than we do today. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess, essentially bragging to God. No concept of, of how he really stood before God. But then the tax collector, verse 13, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He had a different attitude. And this word justified, what does that mean? It means 
being brought back into a position of a relationship with God. Having the problem dealt with. Now, do, does this mean that there were no consequences? That the, maybe the tax collector stole money. Well, was he still going to have to restore the money? Of course. But in God's eyes, there was no long-lasting problem. He was, he was forgiven. And brethren, I think that's a huge lesson to teach our children when they're young, to just admit it when you're wrong. Just say you're sorry. It might be hard at first, but don't lie. Don't blame others. Don't point the finger at everyone else for your problems. It will always be better if we admit when we're wrong. Isn't that the lesson here of the Pharisee and the, and the tax collector? Isn't that what God is looking for? Again, consequences still may apply, but we can work with an attitude of being willing to admit mistakes. And brethren, if our children are, are afraid of admitting mistakes, we need to assure them and help them to understand, look, it's okay. I love you. I care about you. I want you to be able to come clean. Yes, there may be consequences, but it's going to be way better if you tell me the truth up front than if I find out and you were deceitful. Because then, I'm not sure if I can trust you, and that's a whole nother conversation. And we'll work through that, but that's much harder. The point is, though, brethren, God will forgive, and we must forgive. It doesn't mean that we, we immediately take away of consequences, but we must forgive. And all the good play in the past does not earn us forgiveness. Going back to the, the video game, you think about it, you know, uh, you can, if you're really good at playing Super Mario, and you get really, really good, and you hit all the levels, whatever, five, six levels, if you hit a Goomba, all the levels you did well do not earn you to keep playing, do they? You still hit a Goomba. It's really weird using that example of a Goomba having to do with law and grace, but I'm going to use it. Mr. Weston explains that in his recent booklet, Law and Grace, which is it? He says, all the apostles and writers of the New Testament, including Paul, understood that behavior matters, but no amount of current or future law keeping can cover our many sins. Only the shed blood of the Son of God can do that. That is what we call grace. And nothing in this booklet is meant to minimize or undermine that supreme gift of God. I remember when I was small, again, there was a period when I was in a bad pattern. And I was misbehaving at church. And as we were leaving church, I was told that uh, I was going to get a spanking when we got home. I deserved it. I knew it. There was no question about that. But I, I learned this pr principle of, of not earning, you know, salvation at that uh, moment. Because I was always a really, really good boy all the way home. I was quiet. I didn't argue with anyone. I didn't get in trouble at all. And I thought, wow, maybe, maybe, maybe I've earned enough goodness that, you know, they'll forget about spanking me. My mother never forgot. She had an incredible memory. So I can tell you firsthand this principle works. But brethren, God's grace and God's favor says, you messed up, you sinned, you made a mistake, but do you want to play again? You see, because when we hit that Goomba and the screen goes dark and it says game over, we have a choice. If we're sorry, if we're repentant, 
if we admit our mistake because of God's forgiveness and grace. Yes, there may be consequences we need to work through and deal with. But because of his forgiveness, he will bring up a screen that says, do you want to play again? And we need to teach that to our children as well. That no matter what they do, no matter what infraction, we give them the chance to start over. It doesn't erase the consequences, but we give them the chance to start over. And what a gift that is. And that brings us to the third point. The third point. Create a rich and rewarding game play. This is, again, from the the article, Why You Should Parent Like a Video Game. The the author says, in video games, it doesn't matter how how much you die and get sent back to the beginning, you still want to keep playing because the gameplay is so fun and rewarding. You're constantly getting feedback and rewards for accomplishing certain tasks. Whenever we experience a reward in a video game, our brain gets hit with a bit of dopamine, which, number one, makes us feel good, and number two, rewires our brain to motivate us to keep on doing what we're doing. Resets in video games due to dying or not completing a level in time only make you more driven to get back into the game and get some more hits of that feel-good dopamine. And then he explains it's the same with parenting. It can't be all negative reinforcement. It can't be all correction. There has to be something good that the child is looking forward to, being reconciled and getting back in to a good relationship and and a good feeling and meaningful things that we do together as a family. Positive reinforcement. He says you have to make time in or gameplay rich and rewarding by giving your kids positive energy and attention for the good stuff they're doing. You know, if a child perceives there's nothing that is going to be rewarding to them, why should they change? What's the motivation? I think all of us as parents have experienced the feeling where we feel like we're just barking orders out all the time. And, and there are times when, uh, just because of circumstances, our children are testing us, you know, and we cannot back down from enforcing the rules just because we, we get exhausted. But are there rewards for them doing the right thing? Are there fun times that we have together as a family? Are there tender moments when mommy or daddy gives hugs and kisses and tells children how much they love them? You know, I remember how our dad dealt with us and my mother as well. That when we felt the sting of the consequences of our actions, always, always, there was a a word a few words, a few moments of hugs and telling us they loved us and that they cared for us and they wanted the best for us and we'll get through this and we can do better and it's okay and daddy loves you, mommy loves you. That's so important. The big picture they were trying to teach us and a thousand other experiences that we, that we enjoyed in our family together that were positive and motivating and uplifting and encouraging and fun that, that have to outweigh, you know, the correction because correction's not fun. There have to be some other things that are happening that will motivate. Going on in the article, researchers point out that positive feedback is more effective than negative feedback in teaching kids appropriate behavior. So as much as you can, aim to catch your kids doing something good. Point out and praise even the most mundane actions. If your kid picks up her toys without asking, say it. You're not rewarding them for nothing or just for being. You know, we don't reward them just, oh, congratulations, you breathed today. You know, that, that's not good enough. But if we see that they're overcoming something, we need to point it out. You know, I'm proud of you. I notice you, you've changed, and I'm really proud of you. Good job. 
that thing that we talked about six months ago, you know what, that hasn't been an issue, and, and you've really done a good job. Boy, that means a lot. That goes a long ways. Praise them for good, small, tangible things. They actually do. It creates a neural pathway where they keep wanting to do the right things again and again and again. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Isn't that the way that God works with us? What we're talking about, brethren, is teaching grace by our actions, by how we deal with our children, because God deals with us that way. God doesn't just slam us down constantly, and neither does he let things slide. We can go to either extreme. He doesn't hide his eyes from sin because he knows he's got to deal with it in our lives. We've got to deal with it in our lives. But he also doesn't just beat us down constantly. Hebrews 11.6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If we don't really believe there's, an, there's a reward at the end, or there's a reward for having the right attitude, or for seeking God, or for striving to have a relationship with him, what's the motivation? No, that's the way he works. And so that's the way we've got to work with our with our children. And that can have a profound impact on, on them and teaching them it does matter when they do the right thing. And we catch them doing the right thing and we appreciate it. We notice it. He adds one more element. Video games don't hold grudges about past slip-ups nor do they sit around anticipating you'll mess up in the future. Video games are present in the moment. Every game is a fresh start in which the pitfalls to be avoided are exactly the same, and the player has exactly the same chance to earn rewards as he always does. Don't hold a tantrum that your kid threw yesterday over his head today, nor treat your kid like he's already committed a sin even when he hasn't. Just keep doling out dispassionate resets and consistent rewards. Isn't God that way, brethren? Doesn't he work with us? in exactly that way. He doesn't hide his eyes from infractions, but he also, once they're dealt with, he doesn't bring them up constantly. You know, humanly, sometimes we do. And sometimes even as parents, we might even, we might even bring up things our kids have done in circles with other parents. And, you know, sometimes we're blowing off steam. Sometimes, you know, it's, in, in, it's appropriate. But other times, it's, you think about it. If the kid was there, if the child was there, it might be a little hurtful. If we're bringing up their past sins, their past mistakes, their past, uh, wasn't that stupid that they did? And then we all laugh about it. Now, again, there is a difference between good-natured teasing. I think you know what I mean. The point is, God does not bring up the past constantly. He understands we want to let the past go. And so he lets the past go when we admit it and when we're forgiven and when we have that grace and favor applied to ourselves. Let's apply it to our children. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Psalm 103 in verse 1. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know, when we start to think about and we meditate about all the reasons why this way of life is good for us, the list goes on and on, doesn't it? And that motivates us. Well, let's try to translate that into the experience that our children have at, at home. 
that if they would sit down and think about all the reasons why I love being in this family. Dr. Winnell has, has uh, talked about that in the past. Having the boys write down and sit down and write, why do you like being in this family? Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us favor. He gives us grace. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious. God is quick to extend favor. Doesn't mean he does away with rules and laws. And it doesn't mean he hides his eyes to when those laws are broken. But upon repentance, he is quick to forgive. Is that how we operate in our homes? The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. And isn't that true? You know, in our game of life, if he would just do it based on what we've earned, as soon as we hit the goomba, game over, Screen goes black, and that's it. But he hasn't operated that way. For those of us who have been baptized, those of us who have had Christ's blood applied to our sins, that screen lights up, and it says, do you want to play again? And yes, we sin. Yes, we fall down. And we get down on our knees and we say we're sorry and I want to change and I want to be different. Please help me. And he doesn't always take the consequences away from our sins. We sometimes have to feel the, the result of our decisions, but he does take the ultimate penalty away, doesn't he? And he allows us to get back in the game. Do you want to play again? Yes. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Brethren, we are God's children. You know, all the things we've talked about and we're looking at today... This is how he's working with us, isn't it? And how thankful we are. He's the perfect parent. He sets the standards. He's always consistent all the time. He extends mercy but doesn't hide his eyes or compromise with his law. But he always gives us a chance to repent. And there's an overriding picture. He's creating an environment that is awesome, that is great, that is ultimately going to be living forever in his family and being a part of renewing the whole universe. And that's why we want to keep getting back in the game. Because he loves us, he cares for us, and he wants us to be in his family forever. Let's turn in conclusion to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. So the point is, brethren, as we in our families are striving to teach our our children. Let's try to apply the grace that God gives to us and not just assume that grace and mercy means we wipe away the law. We wipe away the rules because I think sometimes that can come across as if that's the way it is. No, that's not the way it is. Grace and mercy allows us to play the game again. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us 
that we should be called children, children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. That is an embryo. That is begotten children to be born at the resurrection. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And that is going to be an awesome time, isn't it? When we see our father and we see our elder brother face to face, the ones that that we have come to know in a relationship in the spirit and yet never seen. And someday we're going to look them in the eye and we're going to be in their family together because it's an awesome family to be a part of. And we want to be there. And we can't wait. And the the longer we live and the more we learn and the more we experience how our father and our elder brother are, the more we want to be there. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So, as we work with our children, let's teach them about God's mercy. Let's teach them about God's favor and his grace. Let's, as best as we can, mirror how he works with us. Never compromising on his laws, his rules. Or letting things slide out of convenience, but giving us a chance to be restored, renewed, and reconciled, and ultimately having the chance to enjoy his loving favor in his kingdom forever. We can give that gift to our children as well, as they learn in our family what God's grace is like.